Character creation in Baldur's Gate 3 is one of, if not the most important part of your Baldur's Gate 3 adventure. So in today's video, I'm going to explain it all to you so you can make the character of your dreams. And in some ways, I mean that quite literally, and you'll know why here soon. So the first tab in character creation is perhaps the most important choice that you'll make here. And that is, do you want to play as a custom character or an origin character? So a custom character has no predetermined backstory. You can RP this character any way that you would like, and the world will not react to you according to your past actions, unless those past actions are actually in the game itself. Now, origin characters, it's kind of like playing as Geralt of Rivia in The Witcher 3. You're playing a character that has a story and a predetermined history. It's established lore in the realms, and the world is going to react to you accordingly. For example, a few of these characters are from the city of Baldur's Gate. So when they go to the city in the game, if you play as an origin character, some people in the city are going to react to you if they know you. You don't really have any control over that, but what you do have control over is how you handle the story with these origin characters. So you still have a ton of agency in terms of how you want to play them and play out their morality, but their history is always going to be their history. But there is kind of like a happy medium choice here, and that is the Dark Urge, which kind of mixes being a custom character and also being an origin character. So with the custom characters, you can fully customize their race, class, and appearance. With most of the origin characters, you can actually respec them when you meet a respec character later on in the game, but you can't change their appearance, and of course you can't change their backstory. With the Dark Urge, you can actually play any race, class, subrace that you want, but you also still have a backstory, but that backstory is actually shrouded in mystery. Unimaginable cruelty whispers to you from within, can you escape it, would you even want to? So you have these urges to kill, but you also don't remember your history or your past as the Dark Urge. So you kind of get to play this origin character who does have a past, but the origin character doesn't know their past, nor do you, the player, and you can customize this character as much as you would like. So it's kind of like a mix between both. So go ahead and read through the description of all the origin characters, and each of them also has a play introduction button right here, which will give you a nice little cutscene so you can hear their voice, kind of get a sense of their personality and a little bit of their backstory as well, such as a Starion right here. Hello, darling. Don't be shy. So custom characters, you can customize everything. Origin characters, you cannot change their appearance, nor can you change their class in character creation, but you can respect them when you meet the respect guy in Act 1, but this may mess with their story a little bit as some of these origin characters are deeply tied to their base class. So keep that in mind, but Larian is giving you the choice to do that if you so wish. Now you do get to progress the origin characters in any way that you want when certain features come up at different levels for their class. And do note, on the right side of the character creator is a character sheet that shows you a summary of all of your choices in character creation, and this will update and change as you progress through the character creator. Okay, moving on to the second tab, which is the race tab. There are 11 different races in Baldur's Gate 3. Some of them offer some sub-race choices as well, such as the Dwarf, offering the choice between Gold Dwarf, Shield Dwarf, and Dwergar. Now, there's a couple reasons why you would choose a race. One of them is, of course, appearance. You just think maybe half-elves look really cool, or half-orcs are badass and you really want to play one or of course dragonborns one of the coolest looking races in this game so you may play a race for their appearance and that's perfectly fine but also keep in mind that there is established lore for each of these races in the game so from an rp perspective when you go through the world as certain races the world is going to react to you accordingly now there are more common races on the surface world of faerun such as elves humans dwarves half-elves, halflings, and also a few of the gnomes, to where when you walk up to the city of Baldur's Gate, for example, nobody's really going to bat an eye. But if you walk up to the city of Baldur's Gate as a Gith Yankee, for example, which is kind of like this alien race from a different plane of existence, people are going to react accordingly, and it's going to feel like you are an alien. So your race choice is actually quite important to the reactivity of the world around you. A few of the races are from the Underdark, the brutal, mysterious, dangerous Underdark of Faerun, and when they come to the surface world, such as a drow, the world is going to react to that. Then you also have the sub-race of dwarves called the Dwergar, which are also from the Underdark, and of course the Deep Gnomes are also from the Underdark. And then we have half-orcs, and people tend to view the orc race with a bit of disdain, and if you're a half-orc, you might feel a little bit of that. And also the Dragonborn are very new to the planet of Toril. So 
a mighty race like this can be quite intimidating and people are going to react. So read the description of all the races and expect the world to react to you accordingly. Don't stress out too much about your race choice because I think all of them are going to offer their own uniqueness. Another important reason why you may choose a race are for the racial features, which will actually affect your gameplay. Now, some of these racial features are unique to that specific race. Other ones are shared, and some of them overlap with your class choice as well, so keep that in mind. Now, the drow has superior dark vision, the half-orc has regular dark vision, but the dwarf also has regular dark vision. So make sure to look at all of these racial features. Some of the races offer certain weapon proficiencies. So when you end up choosing your class, and do note that you can hop from your class back to your race choice at any time, when you choose your class, if it doesn't offer a certain weapon proficiency that you're looking for, for example, many times rogues want to use a longbow, but the rogue class does not offer longbow proficiency, and you can see your proficiencies over here on the right side. So if I am playing as a rogue and I really want that longbow proficiency, I could go to the elf race, and you'll notice here, elven weapon training. You have proficiency with the longsword, short sword, short bow, and longbow and now as a rogue and an elf you can see longbow proficiency is showing over here on the right now do note that some of the classes such as the fighter and the ranger and the paladin have simple weapon and martial weapon proficiency which means you can use all of the weapons in the game all weapons fall into one of those two categories so some classes you don't have to worry at all about what weapon proficiencies you're getting from your racial choice now let's take a look at a few other racial features some of these are really really good for example the half-orc gets Relentless Endurance. If you reach zero hit points, you regain one hit point instead of becoming down. So this may be really good with classes that are our frontline tanks, for example. Really good synergies going on here. And they get Savage Attacks. When you land a critical hit with a melee weapon attack, your damage dice are tripled instead of doubled. So if you're really trying to go for that damage-focused build, you may consider the half-orc for Savage Attacks. Now, there's so many great racial features. It would take forever to go over them all, but I probably will do that in a future video now do note that not every race has a sub race choice so if i'm on the half orc for example the next tab in character creation is going to be choosing my class but if i was on the dwergar or the dwarf for example the next tab would be choosing my sub race and each sub race also offers their own little sub race specific features or specialties for example my main character i'm playing as a wood elf because i want that extra movement speed boost from fleet of foot your movement speed is increased by five feet before we move on to the class tab do note that at any time in the character creator you can click on edit appearance down here at the bottom even on the origin custom tab and when you click on edit appearance you then get to of course edit the appearance of your character for the High Elves or the Wood Elves, you have General, Body Art, Eyes, Makeup, and Hair. Then the Dragonborn, for example, has its own set of unique customization that you can do, such as being able to customize their chin and also their crest. And of course, they have their own unique faces and voices, etc. I don't think I need to go over all of this, but do note that you can edit their appearance at any time in the character creator. So as soon as you choose a race, feel free to try to customize them so you can kind of see how they're developing. And then when you choose a class, you'll be able to see them with that class's starting weapons and armor, which is pretty cool. Larian Studios is giving us the choice between 12 different classes, and there are 46 different subclasses in this game, but do note that some classes get to choose their subclass right away at level one in character creation, such as the Cleric. You can see over here on the left side, we have the subclass tab where we can choose between several different subclasses, but if we were to play as a Ranger, for example, you don't see any subclass choice here because the ranger does not get presented with their subclass choice until you reach level three. So keep that in mind. Every single class has at least three subclass choices to choose from. Some of them have way more, such as the wizard right here, which has eight different subclasses that you can choose from, but you don't actually get to see those until you reach level two. Now, like with your racial choice, when you click on a class, down below the description are all of the class-specific features but do note next to the description is also this little detail box which will show you the proficiencies that that class comes from so over here on the right is a summary of proficiencies combining your racial choice and your class choice you click on this little detail box right here it is class specific so for example with the rogue you can see that there's no longbow proficiency showing right here but if i were to change to the elf race 
The longbow proficiency is still not showing here, but it now will be showing over on the right on the character summary. So keep that in mind. Now, like with the races, there's a million class features to go over here, and I will do this in class guide videos, but we don't have the time in this particular video. Don't stress out too much about any of these choices because you can respect. But let's quickly take a look at the Barbarian. So the Barbarian gets a class action called Rage right away at level 1, and then they also get a special class feature called Unarmored Defense, which is a passive feature. While not wearing armor, you add your Constitution modifier to your armor class. So every class is very unique from one another. And when you click on a class, also look on the left side over here, underneath where it says class. And if the next tab is background, that means you don't really have any choices to make with that class at level one. But if we were to click on the wizard, for example, keep an eye over here on the left side, you notice now we have to choose our cantrips and our spells. And if we were to choose the cleric, we have to choose cantrips and our subclass and also our deity choice. Now, there is actually a pretty big difference between spellcasters that use prepared spells and spellcasters that use known spells. So spellcasters that use prepared spells, what that basically means is, depending on what level you're at, you have access to all of the spells on that class's spell list. So the cleric down here has access to all of these spells. And as you play, that list is going to expand and you can swap those in and out. You might only be able to have a certain amount available to you in any given combat encounter, but between combat encounters, you can switch these in and out. So there's no pressure in choosing spells as you level up. Other classes use known spells, such as the Warlock, and you'll notice that you actually have to choose spells. And the ones that you choose are the ones that you have for that level, and the ones that you don't choose, you don't have at that level level but you can pick them up later on in the game but known casters are much more limited in the spells that they have available and an easy way to know what type of caster you're playing is by looking at the left side of the screen so for the cleric and the druid you notice there is no spell choice over here on the left but when i click on the warlock class you can see now we have spells to choose and also the sorcerer you can see we have two spells that we have to choose but it's not like that with the cleric or the druid so keep an eye out on what type of caster that you're playing now the wizard class is unique here as they not only get to learn way more spells than other classes for example you can see on the left side of the screen we get to choose six spells as a wizard but if i switch over to the sorcerer we only get to choose two but the wizard also can copy spells into their spell book as they find scrolls in the world a lot of the spells in the game you can copy not all of them the divine spells are meant for divine casters, but as a wizard, as you progress through the world, you're going to be expanding your spell book, and you can swap these spells in and out. So you do have to make the choice of spells, but your list is going to be much larger, and you're going to be able to expand your overall spell book as you play. So it's kind of like a mix between a prepared and also a known caster. And of course, there are some classes that are hybrids between magic and martial classes, such as the ranger and the paladin. And some of these classes may use prepared spells, others may use known spells. But now that you understand that, you should be able to recognize it. Now, before we move on to the final two tabs of the character creator, I do want to quickly explain what cantrips are. For example, when I click on the sorcerer class, we can choose four cantrips, then we also get to learn two spells. Cantrips are basically level zero spells, but for the sake of making it easier to understand, just consider them as cantrips and don't consider them as spells. And cantrips are unique in that they don't use up your spell slots when you use them. They can be cast at will. There are some good cantrips, so make sure to look through them all before you take them. There's a lot of good utility use ones, and some of the classes actually can make good use out of the damage ones as well. Okay, moving on to the final two tabs, starting with your background choice. Now, your background choice is going to do two things for your character. The first one is give you proficiency in two skills. So the soldier, for example, gets athletics and intimidation proficiency. The charlatan gets deception and sleight of hand. Now, proficiency in this game means that you get a plus two bonus to your rolls. So if I do a sleight of hand check, meaning I lockpick a chest or something like that, I get that extra plus two added to that roll. But your proficiency bonus does increase to a plus three at character level five and a plus four at character level nine now the reason why it's showing a plus three right now at character level one is because that number that's showing right there is also including your ability score modifier related to that particular skill so underneath sleight of hand you can see that it says dexterity so when you do a sleight of hand check in the game whether you're pickpocketing or picking a lock it's going to give you the plus two from your proficiency bonus but also take into account your dexterity 
modifier and my ability scores right now must have it to where I have a plus one in dexterity so it's showing a plus three now your background choice is also going to affect what is called the inspiration point system in this game so if you choose criminal for example make sure to read the description and then when you're playing Baldur's Gate 3 if you do something that is quite criminal so to say or let's say you choose Outlander and you do something that really makes sense for that type of background. Or as a folk hero, let's say in the game you end up saving two innocent villagers from a monster that came out of the woods or something like that. You may be given an inspiration point and you can hold four inspiration points at one time when you're playing. And these inspiration points can be used to re-roll skill checks in dialogue. So you're not only getting two skill proficiencies, you might look for ones that you want on your character. You also want to choose one that fits your style of play so you have a better chance of actually acting like your background and then the game may reward you with those inspiration points it's actually a pretty clever cool system okay and this brings us to the final tab and that is ability scores and ability points so what do you want your character's strengths and weaknesses to be and this ties into combat of course but also your skills which we just talked about when we were talking about our character's background choice so a high intelligence score will help you with skills that deal with intelligence, but a high intelligence score will also help wizards become much more powerful with their spellcasting. Now you can float your cursor over each of these abilities to see what they are tied to. Strength deals with effectiveness with melee weapons. It also deals with jump distance and carrying capacity. Dexterity deals with the effectiveness of ranged weapons, but also finesse weapons. And finesse weapons are melee weapons that can use your strength or your dexterity, depending on what is higher for you. An example would be a rapier. Higher dexterity also helps you with your initiative roll, meaning you have a better chance of going earlier in the order of turns in combat. And dexterity also ties into the armor class number of characters who are wearing light or medium armor or no armor at all. The dexterity has a lot of uses and it does tend to be the least dumped stat as most classes can benefit from it pretty greatly even though they might not necessarily be using dexterity weapons. Constitution directly affects your hit points. A higher constitution modifier means more hit points will be added on top of your class's base hit points and it also helps you hold concentration on concentration spells. Intelligence, when speaking on combat alone, powers a wizard's spells, making their spells more likely to land and deal more damage, and it allows them to learn more total spells as well. And then Wisdom deals with the Wisdom spellcasters, so clerics, druids, and rangers, and Charisma helps out the Charisma casters, which are bards, paladins, sorcerers, and warlocks. Now, depending on what class you have selected, Larian will put a star next to the ability that that particular class tends to to use but the keyword here is tens because i may want to play as a strength based ranger and use heavy weapons and wear heavy armor but larian is telling me that dexterity is the ranger's primary ability score it might be traditionally but you may have a build that falls outside of what larian recommends now there is a use recommended button as well and depending on your selected class this button will disperse your ability points in a way that generally makes sense for that class although it might not be perfect now as a barbarian if i click on the recommended button larian will disperse the points to give me a really high strength and also constitution which makes sense because those are tanky qualities and barbarians typically use really heavy melee weapons but low intelligence and charisma is also what larian gave me here so i have to consider that when it comes to saving throws and also skills in the game that may deal with those particular abilities now, strength and constitution do tend to be very important for barbarians. Well, in combat, intelligence and charisma don't directly make your barbarian more powerful. Although, like I said, it may help you resist certain spells. Now, generally speaking, you probably want to get your class's primary ability score to at least a 16. And then the other abilities, it's a little bit more up to you. But if you want to optimize for combat you want to optimize for skills or maybe a mix between both but keep in mind most classes also have fairly important secondary abilities as well such as the wizard needing dexterity for their armor class and also constitution for their health and also to help them maintain concentration on spells so now let's talk about what a modifier is every even number that your ability score is at your modifier will go up by one and this is important because the game uses your modifier, not your total score and an ability. 
So generally speaking, you want even numbers, as an odd number does not boost that modifier. You can see right here, when I have 10 strength, it's showing zero. When I switch it to 11, it's still at zero. But at 12, that modifier then goes up to a plus one. Now at class levels 4, 8, and 12, you do get the opportunity to boost one ability score by two, or two ability scores by one. So you could leave yourself two odd numbers, as long as you plan ahead to boost those numbers later on. Or you could even leave one odd number with a plan to take a special feat at level four. But now we're getting a little bit too advanced for this video. Now the max that you can have in one ability is 15 points, but everyone, regardless of race or class choice, gets to add a plus two and a plus one to any ability score to increase that ability score's possible maximum. So as a barbarian, if I click the plus two next to strength right here, I can now get my strength to 17 as long as I have the available points. And then if I put my plus one into constitution, I can now boost my constitution higher than 15 to 16, getting that nice modifier boost. So figure out what your class's primary ability is. For example, if you're playing as a wizard, wizards use intelligence. And then you probably want to show the most love to intelligence. After that, for a wizard, dexterity will help your wizard's armor class, and constitution will help their hit points and help them hold concentration spells. Every class is different, and every build can also be different. With that said, after you figure out your primary ability score, most classes do benefit from dexterity and constitution being their second and third ability scores to focus on, so keep that in mind. Also, don't forget that there are some hybrid classes that combine martial combat with spellcasting, such as the Paladin, and the Paladin would probably need strength, also possibly dexterity for their weapon attacks, but also charisma to power their spellcasting. So with the hybrid classes, dispersing points is going to be probably a little bit more thin than a class that just straight up uses strength for all of their attacks. Now, you are limited in the amount of points that you can spend, and the higher that you make an ability score, it's going to start taking more points from your pool just for simply increasing it by one. For example, when I boost my strength from 16 to 17, it takes two points away from that total pool, not one. But when I boost from eight to nine, it only uses one point. So anything that's past 14 will require two points from that pool of points that you have to get a one ability score boost. Now, if all this just sounds super confusing to you, don't stress out too much. You will learn this as time goes on. And also, you can just click the Use Recommended, and then Larian will kind of lay out to you. At least you can figure out like what the important ability scores are for that class's combat capabilities. So I just clicked Use Recommended on the Barbarian, and I can see that Larian is showing Constitution and Strength some extra love here, which tells me those are probably important for most Barbarians. And then what you do with the skills that are the abilities that don't necessarily matter as much to combat, that's kind of up to you with what skills that you take. So if you have a lot of skill proficiencies with wisdom skills, such as perception, you may care a little bit more about wisdom over intelligence. Maybe you end up dumping intelligence to eight and boosting your wisdom to 12 to help out that skill. Another thing to consider is that each ability score with its modifier is tied to specific saving throws for spells that are cast in the game. So if somebody casts Fireball on you, the game is going to have you do a dexterity saving throw, meaning you're going to roll the dice behind the scenes. You're not going to. The game's going to do it. And it's going to add in your dexterity modifier to that save. And if you have a higher dexterity modifier, you're more likely to resist or mitigate the effects of that spell. Now, there's a ton of dexterity saves in this game and also a ton of wisdom saves. But there's also saves for all of the others as well. But dexterity and wisdom and also constitution kind of stand out here. Let's say you have leftover points and you have to choose intelligence, wisdom, or charisma, and you're not sure what to do with your leftover points here. I would probably lean towards wisdom. Charisma is really good for dialogue, so it's probably better to not dump charisma if you really care about dialogue. And intelligence can also be important too, especially if you have intelligence skills and you really care about history checks and investigation checks. Not a huge deal what you do with these leftover points, but just consider those saving throws and also your skills that are tied to those abilities. And the last thing that we can't skip out on are skill proficiencies once again. Depending on what class you choose will determine the range of skill proficiencies that you get to choose from. So as a barbarian, we open this up, you can see two out of two are selected. So if I just deselect those, I get to choose two skill proficiencies from the ones that are currently showing. And if you already have a skill proficiency from your race choice or your background, it will already show as you having it. So as a Barbarian, I'd probably pick up Athletics because it's tied to Strength. Then it's really up to me if I want Nature, Animal Handling, Survival, uh, or Intimidation. 
really how you want to role play it and what skills are important to you. And then after this, we get to create our dream character. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the stats on this character. This is strictly appearance, and this will tie into the story, but I'll leave it at that. And then you get to jump into the game itself. So thank you all so much for watching. I really, really hope that this video helped you. As I can see how jumping into BG3 for the first time can be a little bit overwhelming. But I promise over time it will get better. And don't stress out too much about making mistakes. Because you can respec and change things later on.